What is going on, everybody, and welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast. I am, of course, your host, Ethan Smith, who is joined by, once again on every Monday, Mr. Gary Morgan. Uh, Last week, uh, we recorded an entire episode, and the recording got lost in the ether, uh, so I have no idea where it went. Um, But we are back today, of course, on March 7th. Hopefully everybody's having a great start to their March as we just keep running through these months. But on today's episode, Gary and I are going to be talking about the defensive play heading into 2022 and if it can be replicated from 2021 if we get a season after some new CBA news that came out yesterday. And with all that said, thank you for making me and Gary your first listen of the day every single Monday. And we will be right back after the intro. On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And of course, everyone, welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast, where we are your team every day. Of course, Lots of stuff going on right now on if we're even going to be getting baseball in 2022 at this point. Um, It kind of changes every other week. It feels like it feels like one week we're optimistic, the next week we're pessimistic. So we'll see how this all goes. But one of the things that we can look back on from the 2021 season, Gary, was the defensive play of the Pirates. Outside of the Will Craig play, which was nationally televised apparently forever for everyone to see, (laughs) This Pirates team is actually a very good defensive team uh, overall. I believe Jacob Stallings was like the overwhelming leader in defensive runs saved. Obviously, he is no longer here, so we'll get into that in a second. Um, But I also believe they were tied with the Houston Astros for fielding percentage as well in the entire league. Can they replicate that with the loss of Jacob Stallings, though? Like, How big of a piece was he to keeping this team defense overall as good as it was? Well, he's huge, obviously, and I don't think anybody disputes that Michael Perez is a. Was it Michael Perez? No, the other Perez, Roberto, Roberto Perez. Perez. I'm sorry, yeah. that's going to confuse me all season. Yeah, it will. Roberto Perez um, is a good defender. I mean, nobody's disputing that he's a two-time Gold Glove winner. Problem is, I don't see him playing the amount of games that uh, Jacob Stallings did. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to probably, we're going to miss Jacob, I think, as far as as what he provided back there. Um, I don't expect gold glove performance out of Roberto Perez this year. I really don't. Um, Competent, yes. Huge drop-off, no. But I don't don't think he's going to be able to provide the same base yeah, and also you have to look into the fact that me and you have talked about it countless times about Kevin Newman and a lot of these guys that are in the middle infield. Kevin Newman, again, a finalist for a gold glove last year. Brian Reynolds is going to be manning an outfield that's going to likely have Ben Gamble beside him again, but that third outfield spot is going to be changing a lot too. So does the turmoil of turnover a lot – well, I wouldn't say turmoil. It's probably the wrong word. But is the constant it's the turmoil, Pirates. How is turmoil not the right well, word? Well, yeah, that, that, is, that is a pretty good word to describe this team. Uh, well, it's a good word to describe baseball, period, right now. Uh, but with the, like, ever-changing door that we're probably going to have this year and the likelihood that Kevin Newman could also maybe be traded at some point, does that affect what you think the Pirates' defense can do? And do you think they can replicate their strong play from 2021 defensively? It's going to be tough, to be honest, because if Kevin Newman isn't your everyday shortstop, um, you know, like if O'Neill Cruz is, I, I have no doubt there's going to be a little bit of a drop-off defensively there. Um, I think the range would be a little bit better, but mm-hmm. he's, he's straight up had, you know, some accuracy issues with his arm. So um, I don't think that you're going to see, like, a, an improvement in the field there. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as Brian Reynolds goes, I think at this point he's Brian Reynolds. I'm not worried yeah. about him. But Ben Gamble, despite some really, really sexy plays, his defensive metrics are not that great. No. Um, you know, I, I mean, if you just go by pure stats, all in all, he's a pretty poor defender. Mm-hmm. But I, I certainly love his hustle out there, and I, he makes some great players. He just... 
I think sometimes maybe tries a little bit too many plays. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he needs to just, you know, take a more conservative approach to, to a few more balls. But um, then again, that's kind of changing the dynamic of the way a guy plays, and I don't think we're going to want that. That said, an addition to the outfield could be Travis Swaggerty, who I can tell you right now will step in and be the best outfielder they have. Mm-hmm. Period. And that's no slander against Reynolds. I just, Travis Swaggery, that's what he does. Oh, yeah. And to clarify, by the way, for everyone listening, before you guys try to create a, like, wild thing about Gary saying something, when he says best outfielder they have, he means defensively. We are talking about defense. I didn't want anybody to clip that out of context and have be all of a sudden you see on Twitter, Gary Morgan says Travis Swaggerty will be a better outfielder than Brian Reynolds, which... If he does, I mean, if he ends up being a better outfielder than Brian Reynolds, congratulations. That's a phenomenal thing for the Pirates. But, yeah, Travis Swaggerty, we had him on the show a little bit ago, and he even said he believes he has a gold caliber glove that he can bring to the outfield. And that's one of the things that I'm very excited for as well. And, I mean, I would be perfectly okay with this, too, if there's, like, a little bit of a defensive drop-off, as long as the guys that you were inserting into the lineup give you some, some hitting to, like, yeah, cool. Right. You had one of the best defenses in all of baseball last year, but your offense was absolutely horrible. So yeah. if you if you drop off from second in the league to tenth in the league in defense, but then your offense gets considerably better, I think that's a win-win for every party involved. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, the defense could be fine, but defense in baseball, it can win you games when you have the offense to back it up. But right now at the Pirates team, you've said this to me countless times, if you can hit over 250 on this ball club, especially last year, you should probably be in the lineup every day. And that's just how that's just the state of where they are right now. Yeah, I, I mean, because if you – but the, the focus of this show is, was defense, and I think yeah. that's I'm, – I'm trying to leave offense out of it on purpose, like yeah. for, you know, what I'm talking about. So thank you for pointing that out about Swaggerty. Because yeah. you're right, I would have gotten those tweets. I think first base is a problem, too. Um, it looks like Yoshi and Chavez are who you have right now, as mm -hmm. far as uh, first basemen go. Neither of them are terribly experienced there. No. And I don't think either of them will be even as good as Colin Moran was. So I'm a little concerned about first base uh, as far as defense goes. Yeah, um, I, I would much rather have Yoshi there, though, than right field. <laughs> like, I, I think... <laughs> I think that's uh, I think that's an understatement, yeah. Yeah, and I would I think that's a good spot for it too. And also, again, I mean, it's going to be fun and interesting to see how this all works out defensively. I mean, they're going to have a ton of guys to see defensively heading into 2022, whenever that may be. But if you want to, you know, bet on any of these guys to win a gold glove, you probably can do it over at betonline.net. That is where the game starts. Of course, football might be over, but basketball is in full steam. It's March Madness, but basketball, of course, as I mentioned, is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fire coach is going to land, BetOnline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is also your source for hockey, boxing, and UFC, as well as soccer. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. And BetOnline is where the game starts. So now, the CBA stuff that came out this past weekend, very interesting. Uh, the word of the day was deadlocked. I think it's starting to get like Sesame Street where we have one word per day that just describes the lockout. Uh, so apparently that was deadlocked. But I wanted to highlight the thoughts on banning the shift. Um, I thought that was the most interesting thing that came from this personally um, because you're going to see to me just from, you know, not covering the sport as long as you have and stuff like that. Really, the shift never really bothered me. Because I was just more or less of the like, of the notion for a guy like Joey Gallo who made it a big deal like a week ago, just adjust your swing. That that's like what I said. But also I understand it from the standpoint that it does give the defense a overwhelming competitive advantage in a sport where most guys are hitting two forty five on average. I mean, I I can kind of see both sides of this. It gives them an unfair advantage, but it's an unfair advantage that.
every guy I watched up idol or grew up idolizing would have um, absolutely abused them for doing. Yeah. If you put a defense like that in front of Tony Gwynn, he'd have eaten your lunch all day. And, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's it's difficult for me to sit here and, and and justify saying that you can't play defense the way you want. Somebody on Twitter, actually, because we were talking about this topic last night, somebody actually hit me with a quote that, like, just absolutely floored me because it's very accurate. He likened this to the NFL banning the 3-4 defense. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's... Yeah. It's that kind of silly. Um, yeah, I mean, it should have always been about the the hitters learning how to hit differently. It shouldn't have been about... I mean, if you don't want people to shift on you like that, don't always pull the ball. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's that kind of simple. But that's not how guys are being trained now. They're being trained to, to all or nothing swing and that leads to pulling the ball. So I guess I'm not surprised to see it. I'm a little surprised that that the pitchers and the players union are okay with it. Yeah. But, you know, as I brought up last night, there were some pitchers like A.J. Burnett who absolutely hated the shift. He wanted the shortstop to be where he expected the shortstop to be. So, And it's not banning the shift entirely. It's taking away certain aspects of the shift yeah which that's going to get very interesting to me in game though because then that's going to be like where is this guy legally allowed to set up like you know like i don't want it to be like you have to think about where you can set up and where you can't set up and then if he's set up out of that spot how do you handle that like is that like a penalty or something like at that point like it it seems like there's a lot of weird stuff going on with it and i mean inherently the way i thought about it was thoughts on banning the shift was for more contact guys that pull which is not a lot there's more power guys that pull the baseball i definitely think you're going to see some averages go up and some eras go up a little bit because of this just because naturally if a guy's going to pull the ball that much and you can't really shift into it he's going to have more space to work with than he normally would so he's probably going to get that extra two or three hits a season I think what you're going to see is a lot of the balls, and what I hope, I mean, here's what you hope when you change this role. What you hope is that what used to be a hit 99% of the time, which was that ground ball right back up the middle, you mm-hmm. know, that hit it right where they where it came from, that becomes a base hit again. Yeah. That's what you hope for. Um, it, it sounds to me like they're just trying to have two outfielders on either side of second base. Um, and they don't want you going into the outfield grass. You know, I'm sure there's going to be some nuance here and there, but for the most part, I think we're just going to see a few more hits that weren't hits before. Yeah. You know, hopefully it kind of evens out a little bit. Um, Analytics certainly speak to the fact that shifting has helped the defense. Yeah. So I don't think we can sit here and argue that it's not a big change. It is. Yeah, it's a very big change, and I think it's going to be interesting, too, to see a guy like um, like a Joey Gallo. I mean, even Yoshi Sutsugo a little bit was getting the shift put on him last year. There was a lot of times that you could see that happening. Um, Pedro Alvarez comes to mind as a Pirates player that always had the shift put on him because all he ever did was pull the ball. And maybe even Mason Martin. Whenever he was going to come up, if the shift was still going to be a thing, I thought that he might be a candidate to see that as well. There, of course, were some other things that I want to get into with the CBA also. Um, the base enlargement and uh, what were they? Are they still talking about the playoff? I thought they already agreed on this. The playoff, they're still bantering back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I guess the players offered back that they'd be okay with 14 in exchange for some other stuff. <coughs> Yeah. Excuse me. Which struck me as funny because last Monday, when they were feverishly negotiating their last second deals, the owners put that on the table already. That if they would accept 14, they could have a different set of numbers. So basically, the, the players are, are now saying, um, hey, that wasn't that bad of an idea. So, <laughs> yeah. But whatever. 
I mean, 14-team playoff, like we mentioned before, and I believe we talked about this on the uh, Pirates fan forum when I was on, it would just really change, like, the trade deadline so much. Like, like how teams would think about, like, anything. Because you could be five games under 500 and become a buyer instead of a seller. You really could. Right, and it's already, you know, it, it's going to be 12 or 14. I think that, that much is safe for us to say. I think... It's negligible as far as those kind of changes go. 12 and 14 isn't going to change it all that much as far as which one is which. No. Um, it's just, you know, you can see some traction towards the owners kind of getting what they want here as far as 14 goes. And and um, I'm sure that they'll give up something silly for the players that, you know, whatever. I, I'm less worried about these little role changes and, and things like that than the actual financials. Um, yeah, the financials. The financials is the reason why we're still sitting here talking about this. And and as far as those go, I mean, I think the owners characterized those as going backwards, which I didn't see. I I saw the the players' proposal as very marginal steps towards them. I, I'm not going to sit here and say that they took a big leap towards them, but marginal moves towards them certainly not backward it was odd to me to see the owners come out and claim that that's the direction it was headed yeah gotta love the word deadlocked right awesome deadlocked your word of the day locked on pirates i wish i had like merchandise or something that i could sell so i could be like our like promo code to get like 15 percent off or something but if you guys do want to have a little bit of fun in this lockout and get some energy make sure you go check out built bar Built Bar, of course, is the best tasting protein bar on the planet. Of course, Puffs are a fan favorite with some incredible flavors. They're fluffy. They're marshmallowy. They're not just a protein bar. They're a treat, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. All Built Bars are low-calorie, high-protein, and you replace your candy bars with these. They are better. A typical candy bar could be from anywhere between two to 300 calories. Go to Built.com and scroll down to the macros chart. You'll be blown away. Because most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar and net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. They also have so many unique flavors to choose from. And you can get a mix box where you'll get 9 different flavors of Built Bar. So you get 18 Built Bars in a box. Of course, go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off of your order when you invest in the best protein bars on the market. And after you have a Built Bar, how about you go fix your car if it has any issues with it as well? Make sure you go to Rock Auto to do that. Of course, with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to Rock Auto at home and in your pocket. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are reliably low for every customer. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices. That is rockauto.com. And going into the CBA a little bit more, uh, base enlargement was another thing that we saw. And then you, you were talking about the financial side of things. What is the biggest hurdle that I, I personally have the financials is the biggest hurdle, but I don't know exactly what parts are farthest apart. But what is the biggest hurdle to us eventually getting baseball that the players and the owners are just so far apart on? Without a doubt, it's two things, and it has been two things most of this time. It's the CBT, which is that uh, competitive balance tax, uh, luxury tax, a lot of people would call it. They're, they're uh, right now, I'd say about $10 million apart from getting this done, if, if I had my guess. Mm -hmm. um, I think if they could get to two thirty. As, as the uh, proposal and they could convince the players that it's okay to let it stay there for a couple of years, they could probably get it done. Um, the players want it to be progressive and move up and they want it to start higher than that. So um, I think there's, there's some work to do there yet. And that band of teams that doesn't want it to go up even to 230, it's, it's still at 10 to 11 strong. Mm -hmm. So, and you only need eight. So I don't see that moving. 
The other big issue is the um, the pool of money for young players. The owners are sitting around thirty million. The players want something like eighty-five. Uh, I think they might have come down to eighty in their last one. It's new spending entirely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know it's not fair, but thirty million is still thirty million in new spending. So. It, it's difficult to to get an entity to give you eighty million more than you have in the past. That's a huge stumbling block. They're gonna have to come a lot closer. Yeah, I would say probably like at least fifty million is a minimum, right? Like both of the sides. So that means the players go down thirty and the owners go up it, twenty. It certainly sounds that way to me. Like if I was in the room, I think I would do that, but it's not my money. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, I don't know that fifty million is just yeah, yeah. That's that's in the middle. That'll work out. I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, it's new spending, and that that's what makes it. That's what makes it iffy as far as you know how it gets handled and who it's important to and why it's that important and things like that. Wouldn't be the first time the players have given up the ghost on young players. So. I could see them just kind of dropping it and letting the owners just have their $30 million because the, the owners have been very vocal. They're not going any higher. Well, I mean, yeah. And I think the fun part about this lockout is it's kind of turned everybody into a financial wizard. We've all learned so much about financials and how baseball works that I feel like after this, I actually am going to understand a lot more of the financials that go behind baseball and why these guys get these contracts and how minimum contracts work. Because I've only heard about it now for three or four months. Um, again, I still think, and I've talked about this with you before, I still think I always get the the actual holiday mixed up. But the holiday in May, is it Labor Day? No, Memorial Day. I think that's when we're going to get baseball still. I just think at some point, once they start missing like a month or over a month of games, one of the sides is going to cave, and it's probably going to be the players. Because at the point, at, at, a lot of people in our Locked On chat, and I'm not going to name any of the hosts, have kind of called this negotiation. They haven't called it a negotiation anymore. They've called it a union breaker. That is what that is a lot of the thoughts that I keep seeing right now is that the owners are just trying to break the union rather than anything. But I do not believe that. I believe that they just have their concessions that they're on right now, and then the they just both sides are going to have to give up something for them to ultimately have baseball back. A union breaker, you would typically be going for something more than status quo. Mm -hmm. The owners are, they've given on some things already. Yes. And we're already looking at, I'd, I'd say, supercharged status quo. You know, like not, not enough has changed that it's going to change like the Pirates' lot in life. Or yeah. the Dodgers' lot in life, um, but that's not something that you would lose games over. No, like this isn't what that's. I don't think it's it's trying to break the union. I think it's trying to keep the union in check. Yeah, basically, like we're gonna give you some, but we're not gonna give you everything you're asking for, and. That used to be enough for you union folk, right? You used to take what you could get. Yeah. Now they seem to want it all. And I, I would I would say really maybe the top 10% of players are being thought of here. I mean, yeah. despite what I, what, what's even being bounced about with that um, pull for young players because – that's really the only thing that you can direct that and, you know, minimum salaries going up. Yeah. That's really the only thing you can say isn't for those, like, Max Scherzer types and whatnot. Everything else is just to kind of keep the window open for them to make as much as possible. Yeah. And I think they could give a little on that and get a little on the other end if they wanted to. But that's for them to decide. Oh, yeah, and that's where I always hear about people, like, I just see on Twitter all the time when people talk about this stuff, they put all the blame on one side. And I say, and I always say, no, the, the blame is on both sides for this because both sides, as Gary just mentioned, have given a little bit and they've taken away a little bit. They have, and they've offered back and forth 
Now, of course, you can go ahead and inherently say that they should have been negotiating well before they started negotiation. Like, that is on both sides. Like, I don't care if the owners didn't text them back or whatever, like, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, they left them undelivered for 45 days. Yeah, I know. But they could have easily walked into the office and been like, let's negotiate well sooner than that. And um, that's the main part where I was like, okay, this is on both sides at this point, is you waited until basically the last minute to do your final project, and it blew up in your face. And the, like, other, the other part yeah. of it, too, is that let's not pretend they didn't know where they were numbers-wise. Yeah, they, they all did. knew. They all knew where they were. And in that 42 days, I believe it was, before they finally negotiated, did anybody change their mind about where they were on numbers? Nope. Nope. They sat down 42 days later and put those same numbers in front of each other, minus a 5 mil here and 5 mil there. So, yeah, you can get mad about waiting 40, 42 days. I, that sucks, and optically that really sucks. But did it change anything? No. The pressure of missing games is what the players needed to have as far as the owners are concerned. And, and that's really what, what happened. And, and here we are. And we're going to lose more games. So it'll be probably yep. this week they'll announce they're going to cut another series or two. And every time they do it, it's going to raise fresh vitriol. Yep. So. Yep. Because that's going to be at the end of the day. Like I said, I think by the time... I've already kind of like took into account that I think we're losing the entire month of April. I just... I already think we are. I think by the time that that officially happens... That's when you're going to see a ramp up. I really do. I said May 1st on my show. I'll leave it at May 1st. May, so. There you go. May 1st. I'm I'm still stuck at later in the month. So I'm at, uh, what, like I said, Memorial Day. So that's May yep. 30th. We'll see. Well, like a lot of people yesterday were saying, are we even getting baseball, period? I said, yeah, we're going to get baseball this year. Don't worry about that, guys. But either way, if we don't, me and Gary are still going to be here every Monday talking about something related to the Pittsburgh Pirates. So thank you, of course, for making me and Gary your first listen of the day every single Monday here on the Locked On Pirates podcast. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at MVP underscore Ethan or at Locked On Pirates. But Gary, what do you guys have planned for the fan forum this week and Bucks in the Basement? Uh, Bucks in the Basement, same as always. We're going to do the five thoughts today and then, um, you know, probably keep you up to date on the CBA and do some prospect columns as the week unfolds. The Pirates Fan Forum, we actually are moving our time a little bit. Uh, we usually come out at 2 o'clock on Friday. The YouTube release is now going to be 8 o'clock in the evening, but the audio will be released early in the morning. So you can listen to it all day that day, but the uh, video release will be later on, and that's to make room for the all-new Monday to Friday Ramon Foster show with De uh, Deon Kovacevic. So make sure you check that out. It's a great show. And now it's every day of the week instead of uh, just once, which is oh, really awesome. cool. Well, that's everything going on in the world of Gary Morgan. Of course, I am now on Bucks in the Basement too, and was hoping that the season would be starting on time so I could cover some of these games. But alas, we are all here. Daylight Savings Time is in the end of the week as well, so enjoy the last week of earlier darkness, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but, you guys, thank you so much. We'll be back with you probably on Wednesday with another guest. So when I see you on the flip side, just know it's only going to get better from here for the Pittsburgh Pirates and Locked On Pirates. So, Gary, thank you so much for t uh, coming on as always, and I will see you guys on the flip side.